sign up right now, Joe. I'm, I'm going to sign up for Mission Control right now, Molly. Yeah, I haven't done And here at Pod 1, we're going to start off talking about the Cradle of the Cosmic Age. I'd like to welcome you all to the Cradle. I'm uh, Jim Busby, and I'm one of the people that, with the community of Downey, helped create this center. Now, when I, you have to forgive me, I came from the Rick uh, Tomlinson School of Talking, so I talk a lot walking around, talking a lot, saying nothing. But let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about with the Cradle of Cosmic Age. This facility was started as a bean, bean field in 1929. And, uh, you know, you're like, okay, sure, well, what does it have to do with the cradle? It isn't Massachusetts, which launched the first rocket. It isn't Germany or uh, Russia, where the rockets really were designed and looked at. But this was one of the places that was the cradle of the cosmic age. You know, and as I say that, I'm going to throw this over to that big board over there on my uh, right here. It's kind of cool. When you look up there, you see all these things leading to where the shuttle was. And let me explain a little bit about that. During World War II, this was Vultee Aviation, producing 10,000 uh, fighters and trainers. And in the middle of World War II, we started getting reports about these things called rockets. And so, they started working in Vaulting Aviation on a rocket design called the MX-774. That was a, uh, basically a weapon system that was basically tied into a rocket. And they started building it. The war ended. The Germans came over here under Operation Paper, or Project Paperclip. A couple of the Germans came here to uh, Vaulting Aviation and looked at the MX-774. And about that time, the MX-774 was moved down to Downey, out of Downey, I should say, down to uh, San Diego, and uh, ended up being the first ballistic missile made in the United States, flown three times successfully, but very limited flights, and that's what kind of started that. Well, North American came in here at the end of the war and said, hmm, rockets, hmm. Computers, hmm, we should investigate these things. And they started building their first rocket, and because there were so many rockets at that point in the United States named it like Indians, they named theirs the Native. The Native meant North American Test Instrument Vehicle. This is actually a picture of the Native on one of its various flights. And uh, as I said, it was a subscale V2 just to find out if the, the basic idea worked. And it was started in the middle of War II and went on. Well, at that point, I can go over to the big board and say that, you know, you look at some of the stuff here that came out of this and you kind of go, okay. Um, after the native proved to be successful, they started working on another weapon system that was going to have a, a basically an air breathing cruise missile called the X 10. The X-10 was the test version of it. It ended up being called the Navajo, and it's over on the board there. And at that point, uh, North American was getting more and more vested into this and actually shut down the airport here and paved over the runways and started building buildings like the big 290 building that says Downey Studios right outside the door. And as this whole thing changed, they started doing other stuff too. From here, they spun off the rocket engine section to a thing called Rocketdyne, out in Canoga Park, and from there they started working on manned missiles, which spun off to the Los Angeles uh, facility and became the X-15. Now the X-15, after it went operational and really didn't need any big help from North America that much anymore, spun back here because basically all things space after 1960 started taking place here for North America. And uh, at that time, the X-15 was, was popular and doing pretty good. It was supposed to be the first wings in space. And uh, as everybody knows, the ballistic capsule won out. The X-15 was still being worked on, but the systems that went into X-15 became the space shuttle. 
And I mean, literally everything from auxiliary power units, basic little motors and everything else for reusable space systems had to be built and rebuilt and rebuilt again and again and again, dozens of times. And that started here. And a lot of this project stuff happened here. Now, at that point, North American was like, hey, this is for this rocket stuff's pretty good. We're going to build a small satellite launcher because the space program has started at that point. And so they decided to build this one little rocket. And uh, they you know, thought, well, it's a great little rocket. Well, one of the guys came back from Vegas, and he was a little hungover. He looked inside this little rocket with the, the, the wings over there and everything else and said, oh, Reminds me of the dice I had. Looks like, it looks like you've rolled a little Joe. Because you had little engines in a four compartment segment. And that became the little Joe rocket. The little Joe was the very first rocket used in Project Mercury. America's first uh, men in space. And it never carried the men, but it tested all the escape systems that were used uh, for Project Mercury. So at that point, it's like, hey, this is interesting. Yeah. Well, there was a man with a dream here at Downey. His name was Harrison Storms, or Stormy. That was his attitude. He was stormy. He walked into his office. It was either something was going or something was about to go. It was always stormy weather in that office. And that's the office you can actually see from Lakewood Boulevard. Well, Stormy went to the head of North American Aviation, Dutch Kindleberger, and said, I think we can get Apollo. Why do we want Apollo? We're, you know, we're not, we're getting out of space, you know, or it's not going to go anywhere. And Stormy said, you know, I really think that we have a chance and I can get us, Stormy was the kind everybody listened to because he got the X-15 project. He got the X-10 and the Navajo. And so they kind of said, well, Stormy, if you feel we've got a chance to get this idea about building a, a spaceship to carry three men around the earth and maybe float around the moon, well, go ahead, let, let's just try it. And so 50 years ago, last month, the proposals went in to, North, to uh, the national government. But by that time, Apollo had grown. <laughs> Apollo was supposed to be our second three-man mission into space, and that was it. Earth orbital missions up to 14 days, that was it. By the time that that had happened, President Kennedy had declared we're going to go to the moon, and the North, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration decided, well, we're going to expand this and take the idea for Apollo and make it a lunar vehicle. And North American came in there with a contract, said we could do this, we can make this. They had almost won the Project Mercury contract when it was still a Department of Defense project, but President Eisenhower threw that to NASA, so it didn't happen. Um, it went to McDonald, who basically kind of copied the North American plans. But that's another story. Um, so North American came up and put in for Apollo and won. Now that was revolutionary in and of itself, because here it was a company that's only manned space vehicle was the X-15. Stormy said, I can, do an, I, can, I can win us a bigger part of the contract. Stormy, you just got us this moonship. We don't know where it's going to go. He said, I can get us part of the rocket. The Saturn S2 stage rocket. Well, uh, uh, Stormy, look into it. You know, I, I, you know, Dutch Kindleberger is like, yeah, go ahead and take a look at it. Maybe you can do something. Well, he put in for the second stage of the Saturn V vehicle, which at that point still was not the chosen vehicle to go to the moon. But he had some revolutionary ideas. Instead of putting a tank on top of a tank, he decided he wanted to put a tank within a tank. It would save weight, it would uh, make the vehicle a little bit shorter, and uh, would be a better idea. But no one had ever put materials like that together, along with you know fuels and oxidizers uh, that might be corrosive. He won that contract. And Stormy, really, around here, his name was God, was God until 1967. Stormy was the man that led Apollo, X-15, all these others. He led the space division until 1967 with the Apollo fire. 
At that point, in a deal with uh, North American and NASA, they removed the two presidents, uh, the two division directors, uh, a guy named Phil, um, Joe Shea and Stormy. And they were retired, suddenly. And uh, Apollo had new directors. As a matter of fact, the director of Apollo happened to be the gentleman who had earlier lost Apollo for the Martin Company. But he is now the president of the company on that one. So um, that's how that kind of got going. And it became a very interesting project. From there, as I said, there was no looking back. Uh, 1970 and 69, they started put, putting up contracts and ideas for a small wing space vehicle called the shuttle. The idea was experimental vehicle. Military said operational vehicle. Military said, we'll add half your money if you make it a bigger wing vehicle so we can launch payloads over the North Pole to look at the other guys. And I don't have to say that the Soviet Union was the other guy, right? So anyway, that's where that kind of started and uh, went on the shuttle. As you heard Rick Tomlinson say last night, and it's funny because Rick's that little shout out to me saying, well, Jim, you're one of the best historians I ever knew. Well, I had to come up to him afterwards. Rick, it was 50 to 75 missions a year. It wasn't just 50 years of missions a year. And of course, NASA could not even get two missions a month. But uh, as I said, there was a lot of promise, but it didn't go. Um, shuttle. Was all, all shuttles were built here. All Apollo moon craft were built here. Um, what I mean by built here was at this facility, the noses and the tails of all the shuttles were built here. The other parts were built around the country. All the parts, when they were finished here, were taken to Palmdale. Palmdale is where they built the final vehicles. Palmdale is where they towed it across either the desert or across uh, the area, cutting down signs along the way and put the shuttles on top of the 747s to fly them back to Cape Canaveral for the launches. And that's what started the whole shuttle era. Uh, there were a lot of proposals that came out of here. Proposals for uh, single stage orbit vehicles. Uh, the vehicle models you see over there, the uh, advanced uh, launch vehicle, the ALS, and the uh, shuttle cargo vehicle, shuttle C, were both models that I recovered from the Rockwell trash when Boeing took over and said, throw everything out. I was like, thank you, Lord. Uh, I literally went around trash cans with blessings of some of the people who knew I was a historian working at a local museum at that point and grabbed all the stuff. And that's why they're here at Downey for your enjoyment and such. So anyway, um, now I'm going to let this go because this is kind of just a, you know, ease back, have some breakfast kind of session. But I've got, you know, basically the Rockwell joke reel. By the way, Rockwell took over the place in 1967, buying it from North America. And it became Rockwell International from, from uh, basically 67 to uh, 99. Then Boeing took over and said, it's Boeing North America. No, it isn't. And shut down this facility and many others. Uh, the community was what put, came together to build this facility and uh, that you're in today. And it's because we wanted to see kids continue to learn about science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM, and everything else. And that's why we're here. That's why Jared and I and Kylie and such as we want to make sure that your kids and you get an idea of what happened here and get them ready to be leaders in the future. So I'm going to show you what I'm, I call the funny reel, the joke reel of North America. So let's. Finally, can I ask you to hit the play button on your video player? Traced back more than a quarter century. 
almost concurrent with the start of an organization that today is known as the Space Division of Rockwell International. Those first tentative steps toward conquering space occurred more than 10 years before the government created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1958 to provide research into problems of flight within and without the Earth's atmosphere, and with the stipulation that activities in space should be devoted to peaceful purposes for the benefit of all mankind. more than a quarter century, there were many moments of swelling pride. And there also were moments of swelling exasperation. And many chuckles. created with reaction engines, so he has come to rely upon his own ingenuity. By the way, that's astronaut and Al the Warp. use of clever and sophisticated machines to carry him to his destiny in space. Space Division has been in the forefront of the space effort since the very beginning. Way back in 1947, the Aerophysics Laboratory at the Los Angeles plant of North American Aviation became a separate department. The company had been awarded an Air Force contract for development of the Navajo Intercontinental Guided Missile. The native test rocket for Navajo was flown successfully at Alamogordo, New Mexico in May of 1948. And in that same year, the aerophysics operations were moved into the former Baltee plant in Downey. Understand now, the Navajo was not to be a space vehicle, but the development of its rocket booster and engine was one of the major advances towards space flight for the United States, and was the beginning of the company's highly successful rocket dime division. Another test vehicle for Navajo, the X-10, made its first flight in late 1953. The inertial guidance system and flight control system for Navajo sparked the creation of what is now the company's automatics division. The X-10 flights were just about 100% perfect. Would you believe 
In late 1955, the Los Angeles Division won a contract to build the X-15. It was to be the world's first combination manned aircraft and space drive. In 1956, the Navajo became the first craft to be launched by a large liquid propellant rocket booster. The first time it got off the pad, a pitch rate gyro failure resulted in a spectacular but brief flight. But later that same year, Navajo made its first successful flight. Well, Navajo ended, but the Hound Dog program kept the division busy, and we kept our foot in the space door with a contract to build Little Joe for NASA to test the Mercury space. Yeah, it looks like the dice. The company's contribution to space flight was being carried forward brilliantly by the X-15, which made its first flight in 1959, and by Rocket Dive, which was supplying engines for most of the nation's missile program. In 1961, under the new tongue twister name of Space and Information Systems Division, we won the Apollo and Saturn project. The early Apollo command module was shaped like a gumdrop, with a galley stack that functioned as a periscope to view the moon's surface on land. Now that was a direct landing concept. We turned out mock-ups like they were going out of stock. This area became known as TP Village. <laughs> to handle fabrication of the Saturn, a new plant was built in Seal Beach. It's a second stage. The command module program moved through hectic periods. Drop test. Watch now, man. Uh, it's not coming out. <laughs> Ruptured heat sheet. Oops. Out of the way, guys. Tests of Earth landing barriers. That happens to be the capsule you see right outside the window here. Oh. And more tests of barriers. I take it that you had to fall to heavier air before they would billow and deploy, is that what I'm seeing? Yeah. There were abort tests to prove the escape system. A success. Uh -oh. And there were abort tests which really proved <laughs> We're going to rock and roll today. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oops. Best test ever. Yeah. 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 There were exhaustive <laughs> tests in a vacuum chamber with test astronauts simulating, as nearly as possible, the actual duration of an Apollo flight. In 1967, the division name changed again. Now it was Space Division. Parts of the division moved into three new company buildings at Seal Beach. Then, in September, North American Aviation and Rockwell Standard merged to form North American Rockwell. The Apollo 4 launch and suborbital flight in November featured the first flight of the Saturn second stage in the Saturn V stack that carried an all-up Apollo spacecraft into space for the first time. Apollos 5 and 6 had successful flights. And then, in October 1968, Apollo 7 carried Wally Shira, Walt Cunningham, and Don Isley on the first manned Apollo flight. The astronauts literally floated in comfort in their roomy room in the weightlessness of Earth orbital space. Meanwhile, of course, we had not deserted our other contributions to manned space flight, such as the paraglider. The gobble wings of you know today. The second manned Apollo flight, Apollo 8, 
went into an orbit around the moon. Apollo and Saturn performed flawlessly, and the engine, built by Rocketdyne, powered each stage of that launch vehicle. Apollo 9 proved out the lunar lander concept. Apollo 10's success in approaching to within nine miles of the moon led to the flight of spacecraft 107. Apollo 11, the Columbia, which transported Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins to the first landing of man on the surface of the moon, July 20th, 1969. Before the decade was out, Pete Conrad, Al Bean, and Dick Gordon had completed another successful moon landing. As successful Apollo flight after successful flight continued, Space Division was working on a study for the proposed space shuttle. Rocketdyne was working on the shuttle rocket engine. Another group at Space Division was involved with science for the Apollo Soyuz test project, a joint Soviet American space flight. In mid 1972, the Division won the contract for the Space Shuttle Orbiter and Shuttle System Management. Apollos 16 and 17 brought that great program to an end. At the end of December 1972, 12 Americans had walked on the moon, taken there and returned safely by Space Division built spacecraft. Early in 1973, the company changed its name again to Rockwell International. But a change in name didn't change plans, and Apollo spacecraft were used in the Skylab Earth Orbital Scientific Flight. The ASCB was proceeding apace with Russian cosmonauts visiting the Space Division for spacecraft familiarization. And actual hardware for shuttle production began to take shape. So that's the tomorrow to which we can look forward. A future using an economical, reusable space transportation system through the 1980s and 1990s. The age of space exploitation. That is, making use of space for the benefit of all mankind. And 135 flights later, we're here. Um, the Boeing Company closed down in 1999. Now our job here on this site is to get the kids ready for the future and let you guys know the history of it. So that concludes uh, my little talk. If you have any questions, I can take a couple questions real quick, and then we'll go right to our next program. Oh, yes. Why did they use Indian names for multiple things? Um, I, I don't know, but I know that uh, till the Germans got here, they were using Indian names. Then all of a sudden it became the private, the sergeant, the, the redstone rocket, I mean, it, there was a whole genre change there uh, after the Germans came in, so I don't know why. Yes, Joan Horvath. Uh, the video date on that was 1974, uh, before the Apollo Soyuz mission, and uh, while the shuttle was still, still it wasn't quite all done yet. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, you know, I, I'm a historian, so I have to say that's mainly because of the fact that when the while Apollo was over and they proposed it, they, you know, proposed that the funds would be split up evenly between the national use, the NASA, the Department of Defense use, and other other places to use it. They were thinking originally, uh, when they went to President Nixon and said, we want to build a project. We, the project is we want to build a space shuttle to build a space station in space. And Nixon said, we don't have the money. Choose one. And so he really, really, Jim Fletcher, the head of NASA, said, well, we could build a, a station with expendable rockets and take forever, or we could build a way to keep going and reuse and keep going. And that's why they decided to build a space shuttle. And as I said, I think the cost just got out of the way. Okay, any other questions? I'll be around, and uh, if there's any interest, uh, we'll take a tour of the... We'll take a tour of the side later, but uh, I, I, if you have any questions, look for me. Thank you very much. It's been a great audience.